got it i can go so i would wait just for another minute before i start Hi everyone, my name is Noman Bashir. Uh, I'm a postdoc research fellow uh, working with Professor Prashant Chinoy. Um, before that, uh, I completed my PhD in computer engineering at uh, UMass MS. I work in the area of uh, decarbonization with a focus on cloud computing, data centers, and uh, other energy systems. And in this talk today, I will talk about pervasive computing, green computing, IoT, and smart buildings. Uh, I would prefer if uh, like this uh, lecture could be more conversational and uh, discussion oriented rather than me just talking about some of the stuff and um, conveying what is written on the slides. So the first thing that uh, we will talk today about is pervasive computing. Uh, computing is becoming increasingly common in our everyday lives, uh, be it uh, data centers, uh, our cars are becoming more and more, uh, our cars are ha have more and more computing power, our smartphones uh, are getting more uh, computing uh, power as well. And also there, there is also a lot of computing embedded into our environment in form of like different sensors and edge computing devices, cameras that perform uh, computer vision and machine learning applications uh, and whatnot. And as I discussed, sensing and computing is everywhere part of our physical environment and it enables a lot of new different application domains. So I will talk about like four prominent domains that has been that have been enabled by uh, computation. So first one is smart health. Uh, so if we look at our uh, smart watches, be it Apple or Apple Watch or Fitbit devices, they have more and more computing power. They are able to monitor our heartbeat. And uh, so in addition to providing like the basic function of monitoring heartbeat, they are increasing, they are doing increasingly complex functions such as uh, doing EEG, ECG, and also monitoring footsteps, how many calories you have burned and so on. So all of this has been enabled by computing and it's also immersive into our everyday life. So next one is smart buildings. Inside smart buildings, if you just look at this uh, building, so we have, I think a camera over there, there may be some occupancy sensors installed in the hallways that monitor how many people are in the building. And maybe like if it is an intelligent system, they determine how, uh, like what thermostat set points they need to set. Also, in addition to that, they may be monitoring energy uh, consumption of the building. So there are already a lot of uh, computing elements and sensing elements embedded into our buildings today that make them smart and uh, be able to better respond to uh, their needs. The next one is smart transportation. So for most of the time, like cars have been very basic. They had one function to transport passengers from one place to another. So, but now they are becoming more and more advanced. Like for example, with Tesla autopilot and other things like in the future, 
we may have cars that actively talk to each other to avoid uh, road accidents or inform each other about like potential um, traffic congestions ahead so that the like other cars can take preventive measures to avoid delays and things like that and similarly uh, it's not just limited to cars we have um, more advanced uh, uh, transportation methods in terms of like um, more advanced like uh, planes that uh, are able to delegate most of the tasks to the compute computers instead of just relying on uh, the pilots. So uh, computing has again an, uh, transformed the smart transportation industry. And I think one of the major um, things that will change uh, as a result of um, smarting the transport would be like these big uh, delivery or like the trucks that deliver goods from one place to another where there are not a lot of hum humans involved. So I think uh, most, uh, quite a lot of companies have already adopted like these autonomous uh, or, or placed orders for these autonomous trucks and uh, uh, delivery vehicles uh, and they will be more immersed. And also, for example, I don't know if you can think of that as a, a smart transportation or not, but experimenting with goods from one place to another. So that can be also think of uh, transportation of uh, vehicles and goods. And finally is the smart agriculture. Um, so there are more and more sensors and uh, actuation elements being involved in the precision agriculture. So precision agriculture is basically a field of agriculture where you apply, um, for example, if you want to apply some pesticides or things, uh, pesticides. So rather than spraying it all over the field, you apply it at exactly where it is needed. And you also use computer visions and machine learning techniques to identify uh, the places where the plants may be getting infectious or like they may have disease. And you can leverage uh, computer vision techniques to uh, identify the diseases before they have progressed to all of the places. So all of this, again, the agriculture is uh, becoming more and more smart. There are a lot of like uh, innovative tech startups and uh, like big companies that are uh, venturing into this field. And all of this, again, has been enabled by smart agriculture, uh, like computing. So in addition to uh, being enabled by computing you can if you look at these four domains you would think that like the computing has immersed itself into all of our environment we are health monitoring to buildings where we live in to transport that we use to commute from one place to another and the food that we eat like where it is coming from yes Oh, like I'm sorry. I can you help me with that? Like I don't. Oh, okay. Help me with that. So it's on the other screen. So what is screen? Maybe go in screen share. Okay, sure. Sorry for the delay. So rise of pervasive computing has been uh, enabled by like many things. And one of them is uh, miniaturizing of computing. So computing systems have uh, started to become smaller and smaller. For example, there are, it is like this uh, um, branch of uh, designing system called MEMS, microelectromechanical systems where like 
there are a lot of sensors being embedded onto like very very small sizes and uh, there is an expectation that uh, more la more slow like growth will uh, continue in mems and they will uh, become nano electric uh, so it will become nams rather than mems so these uh, tiny sensors with computing and compu communication capabilities are uh, enabling a lot of applications where for example like big computers or server systems are not able to be deployed for example these small systems can be on your rest watch on your like clothes in remote areas where you don't uh, have accessibility so this is enabling that and similarly this is uh, so in addition to the individual um, capabilities of devices internet of things is enabling a lot more applications for example rather than having just a small device deployed somewhere the ability to connect all of these different devices together and they being communicate with each other and aggregate the data and intelligence that is enabling a lot of applications for example if i just had a single sensor node deployed somewhere in the field it may not have the capacity to talk to like cloud servers or upload the data uh, like uh, in itself but when you have a collection of networks devices you may have like a node in the middle called like say base station that collects data from all of these tiny like sensors and then uploads it to the uh, cloud for further processing and uh, uh, analytics so the ability to uh, network these physical devices and um, them communicating with each other and having large set of sensors and all of them don't have to have the same capabilities this is enabling pervasive like computing so the next i will uh, talk about the four areas that i discussed previously so smart uh, like a little bit in more depth so smart health so as i discussed earlier like wearable devices uh, like watches just had like basic fitness tracking so they could measure your heart rate and how many hours did you sleep however as you as the like the smart watches are getting more and more advanced they are enabling more applications for example like apple watch series 6 or 5 to seven i think they have ecg eeg fault detection mechanisms and things like that so they are becoming more and more advanced and even beyond this there will be there is a lot of work even in uh, umass cs by professor deepak ganesan jeremy gomeson and like other people who work on like smart clothing for example there may be like gloves that monitor uh, your actions and you may have shirts that are like powered and then uh, automatically monitor your temperature of the body and things like that so this is like there there is uh, quite a lot of work going on in on body monitoring and then there is also quite a lot of work on smart glasses where for example they could like in addition to uh, all the work on virtual reality mixed reality i'm not talking about that so this work is basically um, just glasses that monitor your health for example there is a uh, talk about apple releasing uh, some contact lenses that can monitor your blood sugar level your fatigue your like they can track gaze so so in smart health there are quite a lot of like uh, interesting emerging technologies that will enable monitoring of your health so this is also like uh, quite interesting Uh, that uh, and if you see like they are even occupying more and more of your like body for example previously this used to be just wrist watches now they will be like in your eyes and uh, like in form of your clothes so while there are a lot of benefits to it there are definitely some privacy concerns and how many how much people want to reveal about themselves in order to like what are the benefits and then what are the drawbacks of uh losing your privacy so there are definitely some concerns that need to be looked at while these technology is evolve and become part of our uh, everyday lives so next in the uh, smart buildings domain there are a lot of like smart devices in our homes be it thermostat probably everyone has 
heard of it it learns your schedule when you come home when you go away and it tries to turn on air conditioning according to that uh, your schedule then there may be smart plugs that monitor your energy consumption they can be helpful in uh, identifying the faulty devices for example if you have a freezer or refrigerator connected to a smart plug and you find out that like it is consuming much more energy than uh, it should so then you will be able to identify that appliance and may possibly replace it then smart appliances like refrigerators so the refrigerators of today are smart but only uh, to some extent so they may have a tablet on screen they will tell you temperature and everything but you need to enter okay these uh, i uh, like enter the like devices uh, sorry enter the food that you have inside the refrigerator and they will just keep uh, account of everything but in future there may be like uh, refrigerators that have some sensors built into it that detect if the food is getting bad or if like like milk expiry that is like very easy to detect maybe based on the barcode or something but like what if you have some vegetables that are going bad so there may be some sensors Uh, that are able to detect the gases that are released as the food is uh, going bad so then you will be able to detect those things so th these things are like different companies and uh, researchers are working on similar things and then there are smart locks that uh, may be coupled with some occupancy based or like uh, computer vision based uh, cameras that detect when you came in and if you go out they automatically lock and they allow like only um, authorized personnel into the house and things like that all of these devices are individual like they seem individual but then there are like some interfaces or like hubs that are allowing us to build like internet of these devices or like um, make more meaningful uh, like enable more meaningful application than like just relying on themselves so for example a smart lock may be able to inform the thermostat that a person has entered or uh, an occupancy sensor can tell that this particular uh, room like the person is in this particular room and maybe you turn, need to turn on the music or things like that so this is where the distributed set of uh, devices are Uh, talking to each other and enabling more uh, applications so there are a lot of like phone and voice interfaces in uh, in our like homes maybe it's uh, alexa or google or siri or google home and things like that so all of these uh, like uh, our buildings are again so the the point that i want to convey here is that our buildings are becoming like smarter because of two things first they have a lot of computing elements embedded into their computing and sensing elements embedded into every aspect of their operation and also uh, we are connecting them with each other to enable more uh, interesting applications so the next one is uh, smart transportation for example there is um, like in smart transportation it just does not have to be limited to like cars that can run on autopilot or talk to each other so there are quite a lot of other things for example uh, reactive lights or dynamic lines so you may have uh, lines that are not like built using like maybe concrete or something instead you may have just lines that are built using lights or something and based on the traffic congestion you may be able to like for example if there are five lines like in the morning you may have three lines going into the city two going back and in the evening when the people are exiting the city after work you may be able to increase lines that are uh, on that way so sim like this way you uh, can uh, do uh, intelligent traffic monitoring and similarly i think there was uh, one project that monitors road conditions so by just installing some sensors inside the buildings and um, monitoring the vibrations that are recorded you are able to monitor how like what is the condition of the road and which road needs monitoring and you can also use similar sensors to estimate uh, like traffic traffic congestions like for example if there is a tag uh, at one uh, like signal 
and your car is recorded to be at that signal at a particular time and then you take some amount of time to reach the next signal and your car is Car, car is again recorded there. So then it can give you an estimate of how, how long does did it take to travel from one location to another. And it does not have to be done on each of the cars. It like maybe only a handful of cars participate in some program like this and like and they get some rebate or they can get some rewards. And your authorities can monitor the traffic congestion and avoid uh, tell people accordingly and similarly i talked about connected cars uh, of course like for example if there is a car in front of it and but the car behind cannot like see that there is a pedestrian uh, crossing and it tries to overtake so in this way however for example if the cars can talk to each other they can share all of the information and uh, avoid the So avoid the accident. Similarly, like fleet management is also, I, I told that autonomous cars or autonomous vehicles are more common in, in like, so for example, these trucks and delivery services. So over there, fleet management can be like uh, helpful. For example, all of the trucks may decide to travel together because it helps in the road congestion and uh, like uh, for example you can monitor where each like truck is to provide more esti accurate estimate on uh, delivery of like goods and services of course real time public support service and then so now we have talked about uh, like all of these different uh, smart transportation buildings smart health and all of these uh, appliances so the next i will talk about how would you how does a typical smart app works and how it is designed? So typically, for example, if you have a wristwatch, which is Fitbit or smart, uh, like Apple Watch or whatnot, it talks to your uh, cell phone. So it uploads the data to the cloud. So this watch, while it has a lot of sensors, it can gather a lot of data, but it does not have enough compute capacity to process all of this, that information and drive some analytics. It also does not have the capacity to store all of that data for a long period of time. So what it like typical setup is that any sensing device or smartwatch or like any power meter that you have, it will talk to some hub, like be it phone or like some other uh, hub that is, it will, then upload the data to the cloud where you have a lot of compute capacity. You can run machine learning algorithms and uh, derive like then key analytics from that data. And then those analytics are pushed back to the phone. And also like maybe they, they are shown on your uh, device, like watch or, uh, or just like shown to you over the phone. For example, um, like Apple device data can tell you that you slept for this many hours or you woke up for example i have sleep tracking on in my on my apple watch and it tells me how many times i woke up during night so these things are done at uh, cloud and then pushed back to the phone in another kind of like setup you may have internet enabled sensors that do not need to talk to like maybe a hub or a phone, they may have, they may connect directly to a router and then upload data directly to the cloud. So then again, it's just that you have avoided a, a phone or a hub in the middle, but the setup is essentially for most of the devices is the same. You collect some data using that device and then you process that on the cloud and then like you either you present a cloud-based dashboard or, or in the So next I will talk about, so we said that like there are these sensing platforms, be it smartwatch or anything. How does it, uh, how does it looks like? So for example, smart devices are like, they have sensor node, they have typically very small amount of CPU, um, like maybe only eight bit CPU and very small amount of RAM. 
they may have very low uh, power radios for communication that have only 10 to 200 kilobits uh, per second of uh, bandwidth and then they will have plethora of sensors the accelerometer gyrometer um, and um, the like other sensors that i will go into the detail and these uh, devices these like sensor nodes may be battery driven or like self powered like i will go into the self powered uh, a little bit later how they can be self powered but generally most of the devices are battery uh, powered and you need to either uh, replace the batteries or recharge them and they will have like some uh, storage to store data for a little bit while so the first component as i discussed was like small cpus so let's take a look at what kind of like cpus typically these devices have so one of the most popular uh, type of cpu is atmel uh, like this is a 8 bit 4 kb ram and 120 kb flash on chip and this this consume a very low amount of like power and another competitive like alternative to that is uh, Texas Instruments MSP430. It's it has a little bit more uh, like it's a 16-bit uh, processor, 10 KB RAM, 48 KB flash. So a little bit more, but it still consumes less energy than that. So uh, amount of energy that is consumed by the CPU is the major power consumption for these sensor nodes and the lower the power consumption uh, by the cpu the better because you are you don't have grid power that is uh, powering these devices so you need to rely on batteries and the less amount of power uh, that you consume the longer your sensor node can last there are higher powered processors uh, arm 7 arm 9 that are like in our uh, mobile phones so over there you have like more capacity to install, uh, more capacity to do work. So again, uh, the point is like, it depends how much compute you have on each uh, device, depending on its size, the amount of energy it has available and the capabilities that you expect from it. The next element in addition to the uh, CPU was uh, uh, radios that, so there are uh, different kind of radios that are available two most common uh, protocols are bluetooth and zigbee so they work on different things for example zigbee modulates a uh, phase so i will provide a brief overview of modulation so it's basically how you transmit your data for example when modulating frequency you transmit data by changing the frequency a change in frequency a certain change in frequency would mean one or another change in frequency would mean zero so you either modulate phase or frequency to uh, uh, to, to transmit the data and it all depends on which technology you use be zigbee or bluetooth it depends on the application that you are considering however most of these uh, like these lower power radios have very very short range for example less than 100 meter and even this is a theoretical value in practice like i don't think zigbee or bluetooth can achieve 100 meters so because of interference from the buildings and things like that so then there are also like other so these may consume like zigbee bluetooth may consume a slightly higher power then there are another set of low power um, radios such as cc420 which consumes very little amount of uh, power so for example 9 to 17 milliampere uh, when transmitting and 19 milliamps while receiving and i am highlighting this to illustrate one point that i will uh, come back to a bit later so if you see transmitting is consuming a lot like less power than receiving so why would that be the case does anyone have an idea like would you like to contribute like why is a uh, transmission of power consuming less power than like reception now this is just for the communication part no pre post processing or anything
yeah exactly so while receiving you you don't know when that data is going to come so you have to turn your keep your radio on for uh, all the time or at least like longer than the actual time it takes to receive so you may be consuming less amount of power but more energy and in uh, transmission you may be consuming more power to send the data but overall its energy would be like lower so if you have noticed like we have focused on like when discussing these sensor nodes i have focused on small cpu power small cpus low power radios and that reason is because you have only a limited amount of power available on a node so you have for example this uh, like this is a typical sensor node so total like this can be powered by two uh, two aa cells which has a total capacity of 2500 milliam ampere hour and its system consumption is 25 milliamps when your cpu and radio is on so it's like if you do some simple math the total lifetime of this node comes out to be 100 hours which is 4 days so this does not like appear to be long so then you have to you need to employ like different strategies to increase the life of these uh, like uh, sensor nodes because like if you need to replace if you have deployed say 100 sensors inside this cs building and you need to replace batteries every like four days it's very difficult to manage those so typically uh, there are multiple ways of course so one is to have a bigger battery but you can so that may take it to from 4 to 8 days or 12 days and so on like but it still does not solve the problem and plus you may not have enough physical space to install like a big battery with like just a small like node then the other uh, option is to duty cycle so basically manage the amount of energy that you are consuming a little bit more intelligently for example when you are not using the radio and for communication turn it off if you have a cpu you are not using it maybe go to the lowest possible state that you have available and so you can do some intelligent duty cycling of your uh, peripherals to uh, make your system last longer and of course if you can do some energy harvesting from the environment uh, it would be nice for example solar wind motion but again every all of these different options will not be available for every sensor node for example uh, solar may not be a good uh, option for places like like basement which is not always on or it does not have a direct sunlight wind is probably not available inside the buildings at all motion based sensing yeah that can be for example if you have some we are monitoring some industrial uh, equipment and it has some motor that is causing some vibration so you can generate some energy out of that so there is a lot of like very very cool work on energy harvesting and also like uh, in smart health you may be able to generate energy from your hand motions and things like that so battery power is one of the major problems and there has been a lot of work on how to better utilize the existing battery how to energy harvest and when you are harvesting energy your energy may not be present all the time like solar may not be present all the time so then there is a large body of work that uh, looks at uh, how to um, operate sensing systems uh, uh, like battery less sensing system how to make sure that if you have done some computing and then the power goes off how to make sure that that and then you restore it on the same point so there are check pointing mechanisms and what not so there is a lot of cool work on each of these domains um, we are either using energy harvesting or duty cycling and then uh, Uh, so i talked about like every board has sensors it may be temperature humidity magnetometer vibration sensors acoustic sensors light sensor light sensors can be used to turn on and off light 
and <coughs> so motion sensors and there are a lot of like sensors i am sure that you are aware of all of these sensors and their purposes so next as i um, like i think i have already alluded to a little bit this that you can harvest energy from the environment and it does not just have to be solar panels or wind vibration i have already talked about then you can also harvest energy from uh, temperature difference between two uh, points so for example if you have uh, uh, an enclosure that has lower temperature outside but inside there is a uh, processor that is running on or there is a furnace um, you can generate energy from that so if you look at so i i found a very cool device um like there is a stove top fan like if you have some um, like grill and you put this fan on top of that so the bottom of the the fan's uh, pedestal is uh, hot and uh, the upside is cool so then the fan generates energy from that temperature differential and it like uh, turns on so basically you just need a temperature difference between two ends of its uh, uh, pedestal and uh, you would be able to uh, generate energy so there are a lot of like very interesting ways of uh, generating energy that uh, can uh, be used to power the sensors and one other way is to also transfer energy wirelessly so you may have let's say for example you have sensors deployed inside this room and like the sensor that is deployed in the very farthest farthest corner may not have direct sunlight but what if you put a solar panel and a laser over there and then you power laser of solar power and then laser can be uh, used to power the devices that are uh, like farther because you will have a solar panel over there laser energy will be like converted into like so uh, like will be gathered by that device and they are able to power so there are very very interesting ways of um, powering your sensor and sensing systems what are the typical design issues that we face when we are designing all of these sensing nodes for um, uh, this internet of things and all of these devices so there are some challenges that you face at a single node level for that i have already discussed battery power and how to harvest energy to maximize the lifetime and when to turn on the uh, radio and when to turn it off how how much sampling rate do you need from the sensors and so on so there are some problems at the single node level and then there are uh, some problem that you need to uh, solve when you have a network of sensors for example data aggregation how do you aggregate the data if for example there are 10 nodes and one of them has little amount of battery left it may be duty cycling and generating data at like le uh, generating less amount of data at higher resolution lower resolution sorry so then you have data coming from different sources that is not of at the same frequency how do you aggregate that data and how do you duty cycle the communication of with and you synchronize that communication with all of the sensors so that you are all of the sensors are not sending you the data at the same time then time synchronization is a big issue so that when you are collecting data from hundreds and thousands of sensors it is uh, important that you have a mutual uh, same sense of time like because otherwise data won't make make sense like if it is misaligned and one other thing is localization which basically there is a lot of cool work on uh, to determine just where the device is actually located so it it may be needed for example if you are getting a lot of like if you have deployed sensors and you want to know like if you have deployed sensor in a let's say smart field like a, a, a big field um, for agriculture purposes and you want to know like this reading belongs to what part of that field like if there is a temperature difference between like different parts of the field so you may need to employ some localization techniques you may not be able to hard code the location of every sensor into your system so you may need to do this on the fly 
So you can do that by, for example, sensing how much, sensing the signal strength of the communication. So for example, if I am certain amount of strength for a particular device and of a particular node and then there are some challenges to route. How do you route uh, your traffic inside this network? So routing does not have to just be maybe a shortest part. It has also it has to also look at how much energy is available uh, at each of the nodes that are in, in the path. So if, for example, you may have to take a longer route, but like go through the nodes that have more battery life available so that uh, they are not depleted. And once the data is brought out of the network, so you have collected it at some point and then you have brought it out and uh, now you are going to upload it to the server. So then there, there is all these questions of big data. How to drive insights, make recommendation and send alerts. So now <coughs> I am going to transition into uh, a topic that is actually uh, very relevant to my research and that is of green computing. Uh, when talking about green computing, I will talk about two things. First one is how to make computing itself green so that for every, let's say, every computation that we do, we spend the least amount of energy and spend and consume the least amount of like carbon, like, sorry, emit the least amount of carbon. So that is what entails greening of computing. And then, the next part is computing for greening. So computing itself uh, contributes to like a large fraction of the society's energies need, but it is not all of the society's energies need. For example, transportation, buildings, and agriculture, all of those can consume a lot of energy. So then you have to look at, like I will talk about some of the methods where we are leveraging computing to make other sectors of our life green so i will go uh, i will talk about all of these one by one so first let's talk about uh, computing and power consumption so computing needs energy of course and in a typical office building uh, around 20 percent of the power like or the total energy need is con is spent on uh, computing. So this is for a tip, like like maybe to power up your desktops and the devices that people are consuming and so on. However, as uh, tech is becoming more and more uh, common for companies, even that are not tech oriented, so this percentage is going up and up. And for a large college, like first university, like uh, UMass, maybe 50 to 80% uh, of the energy is being consumed uh, by these um, like computing resources and whatnot. And globally, 3% of our carbon footprint is coming from uh, the computing side and it is growing. So the, this growth has been very, very recent. So over the last, like I think, so AIML has become very uh, like common and mainstream over the last 10 years or so. So previously there were no like big ML model being trained at data centers and so on. So now as that is growing expo exponentially, this person, like the amount of carbon footprint that comes from computing is bound to grow uh, massively. So data centers are a large fraction of IT carbon footprint. And there are also like the personal computers, mobile devices, uh, all, they also play a significant part, but still data centers represent a huge portion of uh, our footprint. So then what is like a typical, like how does a typical data center looks like? It's a facility for housing a large number of servers and data storage. 
so for example a data center in uh, a google's data center in oregon is of the size of 12 football uh, fields and it has 100k like servers in it and at peak its power consumption may be up to 100 megawatt which is enough to uh, power a uh, like small city like not even town but like a big like small size city it is able to power that so like two things first like these data centers are huge having thousands hundreds and thousands of servers and they have massive energy needs so the amount of energy that is being consumed inside a data center where is it going so if we look at this graph we have here on uh, x-axis and the amount of uh, cost like that the cost uh, on the y-axis so if you see the like blue line is the server cost it is amortized server cost like annual uh, annual cost so here i think they have assumes assumed a uh, four thousand dollar server uh, like split over amortized over three years so it costs like 1300 or something per year for that server. So that cost has not gone significantly up, but that is not the point of this uh, graph. The point of this graph is in the other three lines. So if you look at this energy cost, so energy cost has actually become much higher, like higher than the uh, server cost. So I, like the energy costs are higher than the equipment cost. And if, so this infrastructure cost includes like the, uh, all the other costs related to housing the data center, maybe like um, uh, hiring people and whatnot. And also this also includes cooling cost for the data center. So that has gone beyond the server cost, like in 2004. And the total like infrastructure and energy cost has been above server cost for like quite some time so you see that like in these data centers massive amount of energy is being consumed and the cost is coming from uh, like uh, like the energy consumption and cooling of infrastructures so let's take a look at how like if this is the case uh, how much is a google data center in a how much energy is uh, that consuming and how much of the bill um for like a typical data center would be so let's say we talk about the same data center that we discussed earlier hundred thousand servers and so it is like average server may cost 500 watts of power and like if you take average price of uh, electricity in the united states as to be the cost so it would come about to be roughly around 50 watt depending upon the cost of the energy for that particular location. So $50 per server. So if you just like multiply with 100K, you get that the $5 million is the monthly bill for 100K servers. And what about the cost of cooling? So to quantify the cost of cooling, uh, there is a metric that is used, which is called power usage effectiveness or power usage efficiency, PUE which basically tells how much of the how much extra is being consumed to cool down the system for example if the pu value is of 2 it means that the amount of energy that you are spending on the uh, cooling is equal to the amount of energy that you are spending on the actual system so you are spending twice the energy and google's data center are quite efficient so google have a pui value of around 1.2 which means that you spend 20 percent extra on cooling so your total cost comes out to be like around 6 million uh, on top of like, like like this 5 million bill so now like we see that these are like data centers more and more of them are being built and each of them consumes massive amount of energy has like huge costs. So how can we make these uh, data centers more green and more environment friendly? So based on the cost breakdown that we discussed, there are multiple ways to doing that. First, we can reduce the cost of running servers. Second, we can cut down the cooling costs. And third one is employ green 
practices for infrastructure may be moved to um, greener energy resources and uh, like similar things so i will go into the detail of uh, like these uh, individually so first to reduce the server cost we can simply buy and design energy efficient servers better hardware better power supplies will mean that the com computers uh, consume less second dc is more energy efficient than ac so if you look at your ecosystem today your computer is made up of transistors it consumes dc power your led lights consume dc power your solar power is being generated in dc your storage uh, battery storage is all in dc there are fans available that run on dc so it seems almost stupid why we are running on ac because what what is happening is that when you have to power a server you are converting ac power into dc losing 10 to 20 percent of the power and then again running on like dc so it does not make sense to run on ac so if you want to like understand why is this the case maybe like you are already aware of uh, the war of currents between tesla and edison so tesla proposed ac edison proposed dc but at that time we did not have any method of because energy need to be transmitted at very high voltages so that so okay one thing one, take one step back the goal is to trans because we had power, big power plants and we needed to transport energy from one place to another one and in doing so you have some losses which are called i like i square or ohmic losses so i square i square is current square into resistance so if you have higher current you will incur more losses so to reduce the current you need to up like have electricity transmitted over very high voltages so that is why you have 130k kilovolt lines and things like that at that time there was transformer available which could upgrade the voltages but there was no compatible or alternative device available for uh, dc power so that is why like ac power won and then like it became the de facto standard for like power systems today but nowadays we have uh, more advanced power electronic circuitry which can up and down uh, the voltages but even if we leave the long, uh, transmission lines intact in our local ecosystems dc systems make much more sense so one of the ways of reducing like server cost could be just transitioning to dc where like if you are generating power in solar dc power you just directly power your servers that already run on dc and like avoid dc to ac conversion on solar side and ac to dc conversion on the server side and you can also manage your servers better like this is very like simple intelligent power monitoring by uh, reducing your power when you are not uh, like utilizing it at the maximum power available you can turn off servers when not in use and virtualization that you have studied in this class um, not only helps in resource isolation and security but it also helps in moving things around for example if you have 10 servers running one one vm each you may be able to consolidate them onto one or two servers uh, without vms even knowing that uh, like there has been uh, a change of physical resources underneath then uh, the next was uh, like reducing cooling costs so in reducing cooling cost uh, we can use better air conditioning or thermal engineering how to make sure that better airflow is uh, uh, available and the heat that is being generated by the server is efficiently being dissipated there are a lot of like there is a lot of cool work on this so i i'm not sure in the last one year if you have uh, read like microsoft has uh, Microsoft Research has built data center where, like, they are putting the servers inside a liquid, which is uh, dielectric. Like, it does not, uh, it is, it does not convey electricity, so conducts electricity. So, in that case, you are directly in touch with the liquid, and when your server gets hot, 
like the liquid simply boils up and you then condense it and put it back into that so there are immersive servers that are able to operate at much higher powers than like the normal servers and then there is a work on uh, natural uh, like newer cooling systems where you maybe put them in the wild or like may probably like build them in iceland where like it's cold all the time so but like you cannot like simply build the data centers at cold location because there are latency uh, implica implications for example if we build all the data centers in alaska people here in northeast would have higher very like high latency in accessing the services so so data centers that are built in uh, cool places may not be the best for all the applications so there are other considerations like that then in addition to data centers there are quite a lot of large companies that have more than 50k desktops so there are some like work there is some work that can be done over there for example rather than having desktops on all the time you just like use occupancy sensors and thing things like that to just like turn them off or like put them in the sleep state so the point is that all the work that is uh, being done on reducing the carbon footprint does not have to focus only on the uh, data center side but in our personal life like there are definitely intelligent power management strategies that can be deployed uh, to reduce uh, their energy footprint so the now i have discussed how to make computing itself green now i will briefly go into the details of how can we make uh, leverage computing and it infrastructure to make other parts of our life green so for example how can we make uh, buildings green so there may be like uh, uh, some of the stuff that i have talked earlier like repetitive but i will uh, like this will be presented in a different context and uh, i will skip through like some of the things that i have already discussed and um, so if we talk about just making buildings green um, there are as i discussed sensors smart software smart appliances smart meters that uh, have computing embedded into it that can help us uh, make buildings smart and also buildings are an example of distributed systems we have all these different sensors that can talk to each other and make and enable interesting applications okay so in making the buildings green there are multiple uh, like sort of avenues where we can leverage computing and make use of it so for example first one is mayor and monitor so there are like home level uh, smart meters that are deployed at each like building like almost all across the united states so these uh, smart meters can report um, power outages or power like maybe quality related details to the utilities so they can better manage the infrastructure and uh, like maybe fi fix some things if uh, if there is an outage or something so this helps in improved situational assessment and management and response to like some of the resources so this is uh, the monitoring part of uh, like uh, smart buildings or smart uh, grids and then the next one is deep analytics and prediction so you have uh, you have gathered data about how the different buildings are uh, consuming electricity you can uh, use machine learning and data analytics uh, to maybe like for example if you collected data from a building you can use forecasting methods to forecast how much energy demand is going to be for like say umass and then maybe that can help in better like scheduling generators that are of less that use less carbon or something like that so all of this data that is gathered it can be used for like improved forecasting of energy generation demand and transmission and finally there are like some aspects that can help with the control 
uh, and uh, operations side for example if you are able to forecast the solar energy better you may be able so so the one of the big challenges in integrating solar energy into the grid is its high variation so if you are able to forecast that energy better you would be able to integrate them into the grid more efficiently and uh, the cost will decrease and then uh, one thing that i will like to talk about is demand response i'm not sure if you are uh, like aware of it but there are like utility programs uh, where for example you some of your like control of your device for example if you have a air conditioning so you participate in some program where utility can turn off the operating point of your thermostat in response to like some reward so you will get some reward but they are able to control the amount of power that you are consuming in a house and they can use this demand response to better manage their supply and demand like balance so this may not be happening at home level but this is pretty common that may be industries and uh, at that level where they may have some uh, flexible loads that they can turn off like that the utilities can turn off um, to to make sure that the grid is operating uh, reliably so i have uh, talked about this uh, already but there is one um, like a little bit difference in the building power monitoring it can be done at various level for example it can be done at outlet level where you are plugging devices into uh, the outlets or the meter level uh, power monitoring and both of those have different purposes meter level power monitoring can tell you how much um, the building is consuming and how it is impacting the grid the outlet level power monitoring can again as i discussed earlier it can tell you about um, your individual usage patterns and how like if there are any faulty appliances or not so once you have gathered all of this uh, data you like you can leverage that in like many ways uh, so as i discussed which homes have inefficient furnaces heaters and dryers are you wasting energy in your home and is an office building the ac schedule aligned with the occupancy pattern and will the aggregate load or transmission load peak so once you have all this data connected by all these uh, sensors you can answer some of these questions which can help you run better appliances so i will go into the one um, concrete example of how all this data gathering and analysis can help you so for example if you have a nest thermostat it is collecting the like you are collecting um, the data from like the thermostat and also the home level smart meter so if you have a data uh, like a graph like this you may be able to determine that when you are in home and when you are away when you are like away you are like power consumption is low maybe because just the freezer and lights and some of the appliances are on and then you may be able to decouple the occupancy patterns into like seven days a week and see how they change based on weekdays and weekends and you may be able to have like smart schedules that for example thermostat turns on the ac just before you came home and so one of the things that Uh, uh another higher level analytics that can help you is this so if you have this ac signature uh like uh, like this is the signature of the total home and then this is the signature of your ac so here if you see that like this peak aligns with this peak and this is with that peak but the of this to be a particular like away period so now you can like tell that like this was not actually an away period so this was when you were actually at home and turned on the ac so you you know like there is a misalignment between your home uh, and away period you can correct 
your thermostat schedule with this higher level analytics if you have like this capability available so i will skip this like this is like using um, so like the two things that i have talked about is how to uh, make the computing green and that was mostly focused on reducing server cost and reducing cooling cost then i talked about uh, how to use computing for greening but it did not like talk much like it did not focus on using renewables because that is another avenue where uh, you may be able to uh, uh, reduce the climate impacts so there has been significant growth in renewable energy more and more solar capacity is being installed but the big problem with it is it is highly intermittent like you don't know how much power you are going to get because as the weather changes your power generation will change so one of the uh, avenues where computing can help in integration of renewable energy is for casting so there are uh, you can use machine learning and uh, national weather service models to forecast to predict solar and wind generation and it can help you in uh, better integrating them into the grid another use case of uh, this uh, forecasting is uh, ev charging stations so for example umass has this ev charging station so people come they park and uh, uh, then like if you are uh, able to uh, use some machine learning in, in terms of how much solar if they are powered by solar uh, power so how much solar power is going to be available when the evs typically arrive and leave so you will be able to answer how much uh, like time how, how to better schedule the charging of evs so that uh, all of them complete at the same time and uh, like at at whenever like they are needed by the owner so there are uh, like different constraints that you can solve by better like predicting and solving like these scheduling problems however one like so if you knew a fixed schedule of evs like okay they come at this time they leave at this time this is the amount of energy it's still difficult to solve but it's like you can solve it with reasonable certainty however when you involve people into this equation they come and go at any time they want this problem becomes quite a lot difficult like interactive job scheduling or interactive uh, like ev charging station is a much more difficult to handle uh, this may be np hard problem but you may have may be able to solve it with some reasonable uh, like approximations so how, when you involve people things become much more complex so then there is a lot of research focused on how to uh, motivate people in a right way so that they uh, are they they help you in uh, uh, making all of these systems green so for example uh, what in there is a lot of work on uh, how, what incentives work across different demographics so some demographics may be able to tolerate more um, change in thermostat set points while others may be in like i don't know like maybe lights or something like that so there are deployments and user studies that help you understand responses to of the of people to different programs and big data methods can reveal insight into usage pattern and uh, efficiency opportunities uh, so then you you basically generate highly specific recommendations to motivate users to <coughs> summarize the talk i uh, first focused on pervasive computing how uh computing has become involved or uh, in our everyday life through uh, smart health smart buildings smart transportation smart agriculture and how to make uh, computing green uh, the comp like computing itself green and then how we can use uh, computing to green um, other sectors of uh, our life so this is uh, like it if you have any questions i am happy to 
and uh, if you are interested in any of the stuff related to so there are quite a lot of uh, research work going on in the lab regarding uh, green computing and if you are interested in talking uh, a little bit more about it i am happy to do so and this is just to make sure that if you need you have my email address so it appears there are no questions we can probably end the recording